Hi, welcome to another ACLU of Utah video where we're trying to reach out to our members and supporters across the state with new information about what's going on. We're joined today by a special guest, a professor at the School of Computing at the University of Utah and an ACLU of Utah board member, Suresh Venkata Subarunian. Thank you for being here with us. You're going to be sharing some good insight about algorithm surveillance, technology, topics you've been studying for a long time and are now in the news quite a bit. Thanks for having me. What is a simple definition of an algorithm? So an algorithm is actually, it's an overused term, but it at its most basic level, it's just a set of instructions for doing something. So, you know, the analogy I often like to give is one of cooking, right? So a simple algorithm is a recipe. It's a set of instructions for cooking and Hopefully, the its instructions are well defined enough that you know how to cook what it is you're trying to cook. It doesn't always the case of cooking, but with an algorithm, it it is does need to be very clear. And when you teach algorithms in 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 university and you teach in our computer science program, that's what it is. It's a finite, it's a fixed set of instructions that ends that does a specific task. That's it. Now, that's of course a very broad definition that covers things that aren't written in code. You know, you might have an algorithm for how you go shopping at the grocery store. You might say, okay, I always go from one end of the store and walk my way through and go to the other end. That's an algorithm. That's fine, especially if it's well-defined. Um, so algorithms don't have to be in code. They're merely well-defined processes with specific steps to go from the beginning to the end. But when, but that's not the algorithm that people are often concerned about when we're talking about AI. The kinds of algorithms that show up when we talk about machine learning or AI or a lot of things we're talking about right now are algorithms that are designed by algorithms. <laughs> so in other words, we have a, a computer or, or, or an algorithm inside a computer that is itself learning an algorithm for doing something. So you might be wanting to train um, uh, 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 an automated system to learn how to make some 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 kind of uh, food, learn how to make pasta, and it might do this by looking at a whole bunch of examples of pasta that has been made, with some annotations saying, "Oh, this is good pasta or bad," and try to put them all together to figure out its own algorithm for making pasta. And these are the kinds of algorithms we call they're learning algorithms. These are the ones that are often in the press nowadays that people are often concerned about. And so that's those are the kinds of algorithms that I both study and also I'm aware uh, sort of think a lot about as well in the social context. Well, thank you for breaking that down, Suresh. I really like the the cooking uh, analogy there, the recipe analogy. And I suppose the sort of the machine learning algorithms you're talking about, it's almost as if your bread maker or your blender starts cooking on its own based upon past examples of what uh, you have cooked with it or what it has cooked. It's when the machine takes over and starts uh, sort of learning by itself. No, well, not quite. The not, analogy, but. No, no, that, that, yeah, that you, you, you've already committed cardinal sin number one. You, we don't talk about Terminator because this is not Terminator. Uh, this is not Skynet. Law, perhaps, yeah, the, right? the bread, okay. the bread maker is not going to take over the world. Um, the bread. Isn't it be analogy, good if it did though? <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we're already running out of yeast, so <laughs> I, I think in this analogy, the bread maker might learn from different examples of bread, but it's not going to start making bread on its own. You still have to push the button to make the bread, and yeah. then it will make bread based on what it's seen. But it's not it, it's not sentient. That that that, that you, you can you can talk to Elon Musk for that stuff. So. Okay. Now, can you give us some examples of where algorithms function in our everyday lives? For instance, is it used to predict the weather? Is it used in traffic patterns um, for aircraft, uh, you know, like airlines? Do they use algorithms? How do we encounter them that we might not see them? I think it would be easier for me to answer the question of where algorithms are not used. Hmm. And the answer is total silence. They're used everywhere. Yes. And how long has that been going on? When did this start happening? Ever, you know, in some sense, forever. I mean, we've had, you know, weather prediction algorithms for decades, you know, working on, you know, high powered supercomputers trying to predict the, tra the trajectory of a hurricane, for example. That's been there for a long time. Um, I think what we're seeing now is because A, we have, or at least companies have access to so much data, and B, they have access to so much computing power especially computing power that can be wrapped in small forms, like in a phone, 
you can essentially put some kind of algorithms in any situation where you're interfacing with, with people. And so it, it would be hard pressed for me to think of places where algorithms are not being used in, in every aspect of our daily lives. All the things you mentioned for one and everything else. Gotcha. Now, one area where you have focused a lot of attention, and we do here at the ACLU of Utah as well, is on surveillance and, and law enforcement. Um, and, and we often hear that technology and, and uh, sort of digitization uh, of law enforcement techniques and tools uh, is better and faster. Um, but there are some trade-offs as well when it comes to privacy. Could you describe how algorithms are being used within the law enforcement component examples that you've seen and what some of the dangers or what some of the, the warning signs are for us? So I should point out that, you know, issues with or the way surveillance works is very much something that predates the use of high-tech algorithms, right? I mean, that people have been doing surveillance as long as people have been people. And so, mm -hmm. so the problems, the issues around how we think about surveillance and its role in society and in policing, these are much bigger issues than merely the role of algorithms. I just want to set that up front. I think what the introduction of algorithms, and I'll say a bit more about how they get introduced. What the introduction, what they do, is that they allow these things to happen at a scale, and at, at a rate, at a speed, that has been hard to do before. So that's one of the main attractions, right? Scale and speed, from the point of view of the of the folks who are deploying these methods, um, and uh, and the ability to process different kinds of data coming in from different sources. So where they show up? Well, they show up in many places, right? So, for example. Um, algorithms are used or have been used or are being used across the country to help with policing in the in the sense of trying to predict hotspots in crimes either hotspots in terms of where crime might happen and yes i said might happen not might be mm -hmm. happening <laughs> and also in terms of people who might be uh suspicious in some sense. So targeting individuals. So there are two different forms of this. And algorithms are used in this context. Algorithms can be used to process various data streams coming, say, from cameras of various kinds, other kind of monitoring devices. Uh, um, algorithms may be used in conjunction with other scanning technologies and other things to try and make predictions about you know, risk levels of, of, of individuals walking through a scanner or a facial recognition system or what have you. So basically, wherever there's an opportunity to surveil and then which means you collect data, then there's the opportunity to use an algorithm to analyze that data in a way that is perceived as efficient from a scale point of view and um, and effective, again, in a, or at least claimed to be effective in terms of integrating different sources of information. Gotcha. Now, we probably encountered this when it comes to fingerprints. I mean, that's an old technology for law enforcement, right? And in police departments, they used to have books of fingerprints and kind of optical manual scanners that they would use and try to match things up. Then we were able to digitize that. That really increased the speed and accuracy of being able to match fingerprints from suspects to, to known people. Is this sort of following the same trajectory in terms of facial recognition and other types of surveillance, just on a much bigger scale? So the first thing I will say is that I'm not a lawyer. I don't, um, you know, spend time stay studying the Fourth Amendment, which is the, one of the relevant amendments here. But as an mm -hmm. ACLU board member, I try to understand what the Fourth Amendment is because that's important. The, the right to, to protection from searches and seizures from law right. enforcement. Exactly. exactly the Fourth Amendment. And so, um, having put those caveats in place, because I do not understand necessarily the law around this, the difference to me seems to me that, at least from my understanding, you do need um, you need first of all some permission to put someone's fingerprint into a database. And then you need to have a process for looking up a database, a, a database of fingerprints in order to see if someone's data, fingerprints match it. I, that's my understanding of how this works. The issue with widespread use of more advanced surveillance technologies like facial recognition, like say microphones and things, is that they are more widespread. They are picking up all kinds of activities. Um, in other words, the analogy here would be if the police were going around scanning every surface in the city for fingerprints, 
collecting all those fingerprints, making a map of where people went based on those fingerprints, and then using that to do policing work. As far as I know, that's not how it works with fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the, that's the way you should think about the analogy between fingerprinting and these more widespread surveillance things. It's much more widespread. It's much more catching people in the con conduct of their daily lives versus you know, in the in the in a specific context where there's suspicion of a crime having been committed, and um, and again, not being a lawyer, but keeping track of the technological issues around this, there was a Supreme Court case not too long ago. I think it was called the Carpenter case, that sort of said, you know, that you you can't just pick up third-party cell phone records, for example, in order to uh, do searches. Uh, again, I don't know the details here, and I know that Utah, in response to this, actually passed some laws around the privacy of third-party cell phone records to be in compliance with the Carpenter ruling. So. So I think the most important issue for me, I mean, separate from you know which side of this issue you land on, I think is that in all of these cases, when you mention fingerprints, you, you have it's important, and again, I don't know the history of the use of fingerprints in, in policing, but it's important to have a much more broader discussion about values and about what it means to have these, you know, have, have widespread surveillance and use the results of the surveillance in the context of uh, policing work. That's not a discussion we tend to have. These things show up, they appear, mm -hmm. And we don't seem to have a discussion of whether this is something we want, whether the whether there are any perceived benefits to this. And that's often not articulated clearly. Um, whether there are concrete harms of, of harms to society, harms to individuals. These again are not discussed. And and people have been talking about the harms of extensive surveillance since the 1600s, since mm -hmm. Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, you know, since mm -hmm. George Orwell's 1984. We have a lot of understanding of the dangers of always being watched. We don't have, but we haven't had that open discussion about what potential benefits there might be and and whether this trade-off is acceptable to us. And, and earlier you brought up the idea of scale and, and, and speed. You know, certainly the digitization of surveillance allows us to move much more quickly. And as you just described, cover so many more people in this. I want to throw in one more uh, word to the discussion, and that is the word bias. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, when you think of binary numbers and zeros, computers chugging through equations, there can't be bias there. It's a machine. It, it isn't a racist machine. It's just a machine. Um, how does bias creep back into these algorithms and the way that they are used? So if you notice, I said scale and speed. I didn't say quality. Mm -hmm. In other words, the primary marketing points, the selling points, at least, you know, for how these systems are deployed is that they work fast, they work with multiple data sets, and they're, they're cheaper than people. These mm. are the main sort of pitches made. They're not the pitches made in public, but they're the pitches made to sell these tools to organizations. Um, the issue of accuracy is often not Probably as well not discussed. Well. And so when it comes to the issue of bias, so what is the issue here? The concern is that if you use these machine learning, often machine learning based systems, so not all of them are, but let's say they are, and that's where the issue of bias comes in. If you use machine learning based systems to, to interpret signals coming from your surveillance in some way that says, oh, here is a threat or here's not a threat, you are essentially relying, and that's pretty much how all machine works, you are relying on a collection of examples where someone has actually said, this is a case of a threat, this is a case of not a threat, this is a case of a threat, this is a case of not a threat, to try and help the algorithm learn. It's like good bread, bad bread, good bread, bad bread. That's how you learn how to make bread, right? Mm -hmm. So when you do that, what you are really doing is encoding any kind of inaccuracies, biases, other problems with the data you've already collected. And I, I don't need to point out to people at the ACLU, the history of biases in, 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 in policing, uh, especially with uh, you know, minority sort of populations in this country. And so what that means is that there's always a concern, and that concern has been borne out in many situations, that there is the potential for bias to be introduced in the way these systems are trained. And because they work so fast, and because they work in such a complex way that is hard to understand, it is even more likely that even when those biases get introduced, they get amplified, they mm. spread out a lot more, and they're harder to detect because they work so fast. And this is something you know we we see time and again. It's not this is not a hypothetical. For the last you know, I've been working in this area now for a number of years, and people have been working this for a lot longer than I have. Um, there are 
time and again, we see examples where an unthinking introduction of technology into anything that faces society, that faces people, is more likely than not to merely amplify and spread whatever inherent biases they were in society to begin with. And we have plenty of those. Now, conceivably, there are uh, biases, or you might even call them errors, that work their way into other algorithms, for instance, weather prediction algorithms. Um, and it would you know, be good for meteorologists to identify those and remove those, and I imagine they can. Is it possible to remove the biases and the problems with criminal justice-focused algorithms, surveillance algorithms, in the same way, or is it more challenging? With weather predictions, again, an area that I know almost nothing, well, probably nothing about, um, a lot of those systems are based on, you know, the actual science, right? So, you know, the hurricane will go where it goes. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you'll know where it went. You'll know what happened, what your, where your model said was going to go. You'll collect enough data and you'll try to adjust your models. And in fact, a lot of the work that even some of my colleagues do here at the U is look at things like, can we combine different predictions to get a better, more accurate prediction? And that's what a lot of these systems do now. They combine predictions from multiple sources to get a prediction that's more accurate. They have a way to quantify error, you know, on a, say, a you know, one hour basis or on a one day basis. These systems are generally pretty good at, you know, predicting where things are going to go at a certain for a certain time window, but maybe not for other time windows, and they have some understanding of what they don't know. So the key thing is they know what they know, and they know what they don't know, and they mm -hmm. can manage appropriately. Again, because there is, underneath it all, there is the actual physical hurricane that's moving. Mm -hmm. The problem with, you know, when you start modeling human behavior is that you have a much, much more noisy system. You have a system with a lot more parts that we don't fully understand, and people are people. They're going to be people. Um, you know, every every you know few decades or so, there are claims that we can you know predict human behavior, and and there's certain things we can maybe predict, but there are a lot of things we can't. There's even studies now sort of showing you know that it's actually quite difficult to predict. There's a lot of noise that even if you think you have information about how people are likely to behave, it's unlikely to pan out because people do things differently. Mm -hmm. So, a you don't have that sort of that that base that's saying okay, ultimately we can verify what happened. Right. You don't have that. You don't have a way to quantify errors in a systematic manner that cancel each other out, which you could do with these scientific predictions. And um, you don't have easy ways of stripping out the social, the societal biases, the discrimination patterns, the, the hundreds of years of sort of systematic sort of structural bias in the system. They're very hard to do. So I think the idea that you can deploy algorithms and remove error is a fantasy. That's not going to happen. What you can hope for is a better investigation of when these algorithms are appropriate. Are they appropriate in certain limited contexts? And how do you put checks and balances around them, guardrails, if you wish, to make sure that you're always constantly evaluating these methods, making sure they're working within the confines of what you as society or what we as society have decided on, express the values of what we want, and keep willing to update and then and, and dismiss the algorithm if we feel like it's not doing what we want. That kind of constant mm -hmm. auditing, that transparency is very important if you want to use any kind of um, automated system in assistance in any setting. And sometimes you have to ask yourself whether it should be done at all. And that's another question that's so it sounds like there are ways to adjust algorithms in the criminal justice system, but it's not as simple as just tweaking the model uh, as it would be with much more uh, quantitative and less human involved models like weather prediction and hurricane. Okay. Yeah, well, it's fundamentally different because the issues are different, the stakeholders are different, the goals are different. It's a much more complex mm -hmm. phenomenon. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Suresh, for taking this time to speak with us. We've covered a lot of ground. I would even say we've nerded out on a lot of uh, topics that I think will appeal to the ACLU of Utah audience. Um, so thank you for spending some time with us and sharing My your pleasure. insight and expertise. Thank you.